this is a, a sort of a, a medical perspective, and I, w I will um, start with a question. This has to do with a, a quote about tipping points, and the question uh, is, who wrote it? So this uh, life is an aperiodic crystal. It is not random, but also it is not periodic. It is something in between. Any uh, takers? Schrodinger. Schrodinger. We, we heard from Jeff that we, we might have to retreat back to the electron if this enterprise didn't go well. But in fact, that's exactly right. Uh, Erwin Schrodinger, what is life? So um, Schrodinger is enormously famous. He, uh, he had a somewhat vexed relationship with cats, I believe. It's, it's like felines uh, lost and found. So I will come back to this, uh, in, in, hopefully in a surprising way. But let me ask you a medical question. Uh, you, you're, uh, you need to be informed consumers. So when you go to the doctors or you bring someone there, wh what are the first things that your doctor measures? We're going to talk about quantitative personalized medicine. So what, what, what do doctors do? What's the current state of the art? Height, weight, uh, vital signs, uh, blood pressure, pulse, anything else? Thermodynamics here, temperature. <laughs> Someone usually makes a, a joke at this point, which I'm glad no one, um, no one makes about what they wallet. biopsy. Yeah, uh, so no wallet jokes. Uh, so let me just ask you a, a question. So what is medical school? What, what do we tell people the normal values are for, so let's say, pulse? What's normal? 60 to 80. 60 to 80? Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I th 100 is perfect, no? All right, let's find out. So according to um, the uh, always correct internet, this is vital signs, normal values. There's a BMI, uh, I want to ask you. Pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, have to count that, and temperature. And according to this, uh, 60 to 100. Is that okay? Well, let me ask you another question. Uh, doctors do tests. So they measure glucose. And how do they do it? They want to tell if people are diabetic or if their therapy is working. What's normal? Well, a key test in the diagnosis and therapy of diabetes mellitus, most commonly the insulin-resistant type, or type 2, is glycated hemoglobin, A1C. And the target, a favorite word both clinically and in the lab, is less than 7%, maybe. But what are the issues here? This is personalized medicine. But there's some problems with personalizing care, big problems. Measurements have inherent errors, so if you measure something, maybe you know, there's a plus or minus. Doctors rarely give you that, those error bars. Targets may be moving targets. Hemoglobin A1C depends on age. It, the guidelines vary. That's a problem. You can hit the target and also cause big problems. You can make people hypoglycemic. They'll have a perfect hemoglobin A1C, but, uh, but a little bit of hypoglycemia uh, can uh, cause major uh, irreversible problems. Your blood pressure depends on the context. Is it at rest with exercise, medications? There's chronobiology. If your blood pressure doesn't dip, as it's called, during stage four, three, four sleep, that's a problem. We don't measure that generally. And your heart rate. You can have a heart rate of 90. It may be fine if you're walking. But if you're at rest, not so good. And if you're at maximum exercise, there's something wrong. It should go up you know, to about 220 minus your age is the rule of thumb. So there, there's a context dependency. Uh, let me tell you a, a, a medical secret. Don't tell anyone. Current practice pays almost no attention to physiologic dynamics, that is time series. It's mainly about single values or means plus or minus standard deviations. So here's, uh, so what's, what's the problem? Well, your heart rate varies from beat to beat. This is called heart rate variability. This is two and a half seconds of data. It's the ECG. That's what doctors look at. But there are those uh, slight variations. 
Well, it could be noise, instrumental, or that famous biologic noise. What do you think? What do we do with it? Well, it turns out, well, I care. The answer is that the way your heart rate varies is, in fact, due to something called the neuroautonomic nervous system, the involuntary nervous system, and a bunch of other factors which are part of a very complex set of networks, networks within networks that impinge on the pacemaker of the heart in the right atrium. And all these factors are converging. The heart is at the, at the vortex of all these systems. So the B2B variability of the, of the heart encodes information about physiologic complexity, about integrative physiology. So it has nothing to do with cardiology in a sense. I'm a cardiologist by training. Heartbeat variability is minimally about the heart. So what it speaks to is that, that these time series actually represent, we heard the word cascades. They're cascades of coupled nonlinear feedback networks. They interact over multiple spatial and temporal scales. That's the essence of, of integrated physiology. How do we probe that? Well, the heart, heart rate variability turns out to be one way of looking at that, just one way. Well, a question that comes up is, where does classical homeostasis fit in here? We'll come back to that. So let me ask you the most personalized of, of, um, of things here. Here are two heart rate time series. In medical school, we never uh, looked at time series. We look at you know, means, plus or minus. That's how you get into journals. But here we're going to look actually at the, this is taken from the ECG now. And the interbeat intervals have been converted to heart rate. There is the top one. There is the bottom one. Heart rate is on the, on the y-axis. Time uh, is a quarter of an hour uh, on the x-axis. And uh, these are taken off of the points of those QRS complexes, what's called the RR intervals. Real time, so this is what, what uh, you would look at. So you get a choice. This choice of your life, because whatever you pick, you get. <laughs> Imagine that becomes incorporated into your physiology automatically. Choose carefully, because one of these is perfectly, from a perfectly healthy younger person who's going to live in a long, long, happily ever after life. The other one is from someone with a life-threatening condition with a 50% one to two year mortality. Which do you want? You want the top one? Anyone want the bottom one? This is, oh, uh, yeah, so uh, the context dependency. It actually wouldn't matter here because these are, are so uh, blatantly, uh, iconically uh, representative of the class of normality and this other condition. But we'll say minimal activity or even uh, it could be during, uh, during rest. How many want the top? You have to vote here. You can't abstain. It's like with the medical students I have. That, you, know, you say, what is it? And they just say, have them not raise their hand. The answer is, what are you going to write in the chart? You can't bill for it is the practical question. <laughs> How many want the bottom? All right. So well, let me get, make sure everyone gets this right, because I don't want anyone leaving here uh, under a cloud. <laughs> Imagine you were translating uh, one of these into music. How is that? Or, so let's redo it now. Let me ask you another question. Look at this as from the arrow of time. Which one is the most time symmetric? Which one is the least time symmetric? So the one that would make the best music and is the least time symmetric is probably the one you ought to pick. So let's vote again. How many want the top one? How, does anyone still want the bottom one? Still, no one wants, you, you still want the bottom one? All right, let's find out the answer here. Well, that's heart failure. So wh how could we know that and why, why is that? Which is the more complex? Is that a meaningful question? So l let me share with you three notions. Uh, these are working hypotheses. One is that, it, that there is basic and clinical information that's hidden, encoded in, in spatial and temporal fluctuations, time series. The second is that the degree of complexity, not a rigorously defined term, but one which we'll try to have a, an emergent definition of, reflects system capacity to respond 
uh, of response and adaptiveness to perturbations. And with pathology, with aging, with biotoxicity, this ensemble of properties uh, degrades. So let's look at the, at the um, what, is, what does it mean to be complex? Well, we'll go back to the heart rate dynamics. And the features here are ones that, that we have talked about or have come up in various guises. So once again, this is a, it's kind of a, it's a raggedy looking signal. And you feel your pulse and you say, well, that's, that's measurement artifact. I have a regular pulse. And the answer is, well, you can't feel these variations. And we can tell it whether they are noise or not. You actually can separate noise from, from, uh, from complex variability. But one of the, um, one of the, so there are several hallmarks here of, of complex heart rate dynamics. One is non-stationarity. We've heard that term. The statistics change with time. That was what Jeff uh, said. Things change. The, the thing speaks for itself. There's nonlinearity, which in biology is called crosstalk. The fluctuations here are actually multi-scale. They, they are fractal. There's scale invariance, something that Gene uh, mentioned. They have no characteristic scale. And there's also time irreversibility. This signal does not read the same left and right. It is not a palindrome. And I'll show you that in, in just a second. So it's an interesting just to comment semantically here. We have definitions of what it is to be alive based on, uh, on non-stationary, non-linearity, no characteristic scale, and a marker of non-equilibrium dynamics. That's like you know, calling being alive being non-dead. There's a semantic bias there. How do, you get, you know, how do you get a graduate student to come to your lab to study these things, you know, the, the properties of being non? Well, time irreversibility is actually uh, is historically interesting, but it, it turns out to be medically interesting. This is health. This is our heart failure uh, patient. Which of these is the more time irreversible? Well, I've done that here. We've, we've taken this, we've spelled it out the way it is, and then reversed it. It actually does not look the same. And how can you tell? Well, there's a, there's a little bit of, of physiologic knowledge here. It turns out that, that you need more steps to get your heart rate up, more beats, than to have it come down. It comes down uh, more abruptly. And that's related to the bioenergetics of heart rate control. So this one here actually looks OK. They have the same statistical properties, same mean, same variance, same Fourier transform. But there's something different. The heart failure one, you can do it this way or this way, it would be very hard to tell. So here's a, a bit of advice. If, if you were being monitored and, and your ECG looks like a sine wave, call a doctor. Not good. So time asymmetry, I, I, I understand uh, that, uh, that broken symmetries are part of modern physics. Uh, this is a broken asymmetry that as we get closer to what's more of a time reversible state, that's pathology. So why are physiologic signals, why are the systems that generate them so complex? Well, for one thing, the physiology is regulated by multiple control systems operating over multiple time scales. The output signals exhibit correlations, temporal correlations in this case. There has to be memory for the system to be adaptive, to be resilient, to be able to cope. Uh, it has to have some memory of where it was. There has, there has, has to be what, what turns out to be scaling in the system. And, and physiology has a big problem. It has to adapt to an environment that's unpredictable. A lot of things in life are broken plays. And the ability to adapt, to be creative biologically, is an imperative. You cannot have a physiologic system that's locked in to a characteristic uh, scale. So what does that look like? Here, here's the collapse of complexity uh, with life-threatening uh, disease. This is health. When I was in medical school, no one ever defined health quantitatively, ever. I haven't heard it defined since. We would go to medical school to learn about health and disease. No one ever defined health. But it is in, 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 represented dynamically by uh, this 
notion of complexity. And if you have something that's, that has multi-scale variability and all those other properties, and you really beat on it, it can only go in two directions. It can break down entirely, and all the correlations go away, and you have unfettered randomness, uncorrelated randomness. This is an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. Or you can go from multi-scale variability to a characteristic scale, the opposite of being fractal. As Gene said, not everything is scale invariant, you know, it has a straight line on a log-log plot. This is the opposite of being fractal, of having a characteristic scale. You can actually tell what it is. There's one cycle about every minute. If you show that to a cardiopulmonary specialist, they're going to come up with a diagnosis. What causes the heart rate to be like a siren you know, with a frequency of, of about 0.02 hertz? Well, if you, you have to watch someone with their breathing pattern for, for a few minutes. We don't have time in medicine to do that anymore, apparently. But uh, there's a diagnosis there. That's called periodic breathing. It's a marker of heart failure, chain stokes breathing. So this brings us back to where we started. Healthy dynamics are, are poised between too much order and uncorrelated randomness. That brings us to something that we'll call Schrodinger space. It's not crystalline. It's not a gas. It's in a funny, strange, in-between state. And the, once again, this excessive periodicity here uh, is actually a signature, a dynamical signature of chain stokes, breathing, central sleep apnea. It's a marker of heart failure, dynamical biomarker. Well, here's another problem. What's the target in a network of networks? Forget the, the, the this is not, this is a cartoon, but it speaks to, you know, how this very, very elegant uh, micro dissection of a system. And the answer is, uh, you got to be, as uh, has been discussed here, you have to be careful. Targeted interventions may backfire in a nonlinear system. The, the law of unintended consequences prevails. Uh, you hit a target, but if the thing is nonlinear, you can get effects from here that somehow affect things way off screen. They may not even be in this precinct. So just to give you an example, it turns out that in the engineer type of, of drug development, heart failure is from a too low a cardiac output uh, despite high filling pressures. The linear approach to treating heart failure was to increase the pumping strength of the heart. It's called inotropy. And there were oral drugs, milrinone and dysnarinone. They're no longer on the market. They did people in. What's on the, uh, it now essential for care is actually to interrupt the vicious cycle of low cardiac output, high sympathetic tone, low cardiac output, high sy uh, sympathetic tone. It's a vicious cycle. That network type of therapy involved the use of beta blockers. When I went to medical school, if you gave beta blockers to someone with heart failure because they reduced the strength of the heart somewhat, you would be thrown out. You'd be sued and, and uh, thrown out. Now, if you don't give beta blockers to people with heart failure, guess what? You get sued yeah, and thrown out. Yeah, so uh, this is sort of outside of the box uh, therapy. So there are many off-target surprises, it turns out. A whole list of drugs that are called antiarrhythmic, this is the cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial, are not used. If you use them, uh, you'll be disbarred. Vioxx, and there was the bright idea of using niacin plus simvastatin. Uh, you can't do a cardiac study unless you have a good acronym. That's a, that's a, that's a uh, law of nature. I am not sure what AIM HIGH stands for, but it's, uh, they, they aimed high and they shot low. Uh, Avastin, uh, it, it, it turns out that blocking angiogenesis may be helpful, but it can also cause cardiovascular consequences. One of the most famous, uh, infamous drugs, torcetrabib, uh, raises HDL through a targeted effect on a cholesterol transport protein. Raising HDL is the holy grail of, of modern pharmacology because it's associated with uh, increased longevity. You can make someone immortal. Turned out that they raised the HDL and mortality was so ex excessive they had to call off the study. The CEO of Pfizer uh, stepped down. So that story goes on. 
So how do we measure complexity and how do we measure complexity loss? Because somehow we would like to restore or maintain that complexity found. And the answer is there's no single uh, probe, there's no single metric. You need, a, you, you need an ensemble of things to get at uh, properties that are related to complexity. And, and uh, some of them are listed here. There's sort of a, there's a, um, a, there's a quest for, you know, give me the measure of heart rate variability. Give me one thing I can do. Well, that doesn't exist any more than you can say, well, tell me, you know, give me the bottom line to, you know, to Hamlet. You know, give me the punchline or, you know, summarize, uh, summarize the Jupiter Symphony. Give me the mean and the variance of the, you know, that's what you'd publish. If, if that sounds, it's absurd. But that's what we want from, from uh, the big data of medicine. Well, Mozart's big data. Let's, you know, let's do some data reduction and then, you know, we'll compare it with something else and there's a p-value. Great. Well, one of the, the tools we, uh, we use, uh, which is developed in our, our lab, Malin Acosta and C.K. Peng, and is uh, based on work that was done by Zhang, uh, is called multi-scale entropy. The word multi-scale comes up. I'm not going to go into it in detail. It's an entropy measure. Uh, this, uh, it's at this website uh, called Physionet, which is an NIH-supported uh, uh, resource. Gene Stanley was part of the founding team that, that uh, developed this. Uh, what is multi-scale entropy? Well, it's a way of measuring entropy, irregularity, but not over just one time scale, which is uh, conventional. So you measure the entropy of the original signal. In this case, we want to get at multi-scale properties. So the way this is done briefly is to do a coarse graining procedure. You start with, a, with the first time scale, then you average every two data points that, that are non-overlapping. That's coarse graining. And then you can plot the entropy as a function of this type of scale factor. So it's like uh, doing the entropy on progressively low-pass filtered signals. And then you can look at their profile. What does that look like? Well, here are time series. This is healthy, heart failure, CHF, atrial fibrillation. The healthy one is, is uh, irregular. This one is irregular. This one is very irregular. Variability and, and complexity are not the same. This is what multi-scale entropy looks like. It's a graph of scale factors. Scale one is the classic entropy. Sample entropy is a way of measuring entropy. It's, uh, it's called SAMPEN. It was based on approximate entropy, APEN, developed by Steve Pincus, a mathematician, which is based on the uh, kolmogorov sinai entropy. And in this case, what you can see is a, a healthy individual, this time series, uh, the, the sample entry goes up, and then it's, it's pretty much flat, stays high despite the coarse graining. Heart failure starts about the same place and then it, it, it stays low. And atrial fibrillation is very irregular, but when you do the coarse graining, you get this monotonic decrease uh, in, uh, in sample entropy. So we can now start to differentiate between variability and something we'll interpret as, uh, as related to complexity. There's a more generalized form of this. You can actually look at the entropy of uh, pulsatility, of volatility, burstiness. You can take a look at this paper. I, I want to just show you in the last few minutes how this plays out in <coughs> translational medicine. And the example is measuring uh, the complexity of glucose fluctuations in diabetes. It affects millions of Americans. Uh, there are monitors that you can leave on for a week or so, or a week, uh, that measure the glucose from a subcutaneous probe. A little uh, right under the skin. Uh, it's not painful, I understand, but I haven't had one. Uh, and it, it transmits the, uh, the tissue glucose to, the, uh, uh, to a sensor. And it's called CGM. The problem is that diabetes is one of the world's most prevalent conditions. It has huge morbidity and mortality. The management focuses on lowering glucose toward a normal range, but not too low, uh, but ignores the dynamics pretty much of, of of the time series. So let's look for information that might be encoded in the time series. This is another complex network that, that regulates glucose. And even more complex is the underlying micro machinery, PPARs. And here's what your doctor would look at in the office. They get a printout of this uh, thing that samples glucose every five minutes. That looks great. You're something wrong with your eyes. Uh, and the doctor has about you know, less time than I have to look at this. Oh my god, uh, the different columns are different days. There are all sorts of statistics. There are pie charts. What do you do with this? It's big data. 
but the n of one, and someone's life depends on it. So the idea was, can you do dynamical glucometry? Can we use multi-scale entropy and other measures to actually see, test the hypothesis that, that the complexity of glucose fluctuations, regardless of the mean or the variance, because multi-scale entropy doesn't, it, it takes out those uh, quantities, uh, is reduced in, uh, in diabetes. And so we looked at, it was, uh, data is failed on a small group of, of patients, uh, elderly and non-diabetic, 18 and 12. And what does it look like? Here's what you get uh, when you plot out a time series. They do not show this on the glucose monitor, although you can, uh, you can easily plot it out. This is what, uh, this is a subject um, who's healthy or uh, control, and this is a diabetic subject. The healthy subject, or non-diabetic, shows kind of irregular fluctuations. So how do we know that isn't noise? We tested for that, because you can do surrogate testing. You can randomize that, and there is information encoded here. Uh, this one has bigger variance, larger fluctuations, but they're more periodic. There's less high frequency, and it turns out, when you look at the, at the multi-scale entropy, that sample entropy versus time scale, this is control, this is diabetic. They're significantly lower. So what do you do? Well, it's up for, it's a, it's a jump ball. But the, the idea is that you can personalize diagnosis and therapy, and that current targeted uh, strategies focus almost exclusively on lowering glucose toward a normal range and to lowering hemoglobin A1C. That's the target. But the question is, can we enhance drug development by extending the conventional notion of therapeutic targets to include the overall system as a target? That's the idea. Can, is the system itself also a target? And what would that mean? Well, system is target. And nonlinear systems, which is all a biomedicine, off-target effects are unavoidable. There's no way of hitting a target and not hitting something off-target because they are connected. The use of dynamical assays, dynamical glucometry in this case, is, uh, uh, is needed to probe integrative effects. We want to go beyond the mean and the standard deviation. They're not irrelevant at all. Your mean heart rate is 180. We need to know that. It's just that there's information above and beyond. Maintaining and restoring com complexity, which is system resilience, flexibility, metabolic uh, flexibility is a term that's used, may be clinical goals. And, and not just moving a biomarker toward uh, the right direction, not just raising HDL, but how do you do it? If you raise HDL but you lower system complexity, I'm not sure you would want to take that drug. If I tell you I'm going to give you a drug, it's going to reduce your system complexity, but it'll do just the right thing for your, uh, for your bad cholesterol. You going to take it? Not sure. We don't know. So finally, finally, uh, just to revisit homeostasis, the, this is the, the driving uh, tenet of, of physiology, that the idea that the body is like a, a servo mechanism, a machine. Uh, and clearly, autoregulatory mechanisms have to keep things in bounds. That's for sure. You, your pH gets out of bounds, you, you've got a, a lethal problem. The question is, how does the body do work to, to do that? This is homeostasis. You're at a, a, a base, baseline. Constancy is the wisdom of the body. That's what uh, Walter Cannon, Cannon said. That's what. Uh, uh, it has been uh, the, the guiding principle. There's a perturbation, and then you restore. And Cannon said, well, it's an equilibrium-like state. It's a steady state. It's, uh, it's pretty constant. That's maybe a little bit more controversial, because if what's needed to maintain, to, to do the business of homeostasis, is actually to have complexity, then that would, uh, that would alter the way we look at, um, uh, at interventions. So on the, on the final slide, the or is, is spatiotemporal complexity itself a biomarker and maybe even a mechanism of healthy stability? In order for us to be resilient, to have reserve, to have the capacity to, to cope, does our system have to have this free-running inherent type of correlated uh, variability? We don't just sit at a constant state where we have this type of, of baseline uh, fluctuation. 
And if that's the case, then it would alter hypothesis development, it would alter drug development, it would alter experimental design, it would change the dynamical lenses, if you will, the dynamical apertures through which we look for, for data in endo systems inside, in ecosystems perhaps, uh, and at, at, uh, at clinical data. So I, I'll leave you uh, with that thought, and I thank you for your attention. So you mentioned also chronobiology in the beginning of your talk. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering how it is possible, and if you have tried essentially to separate the two signals, glucose is another physiological rhythm that we know it has um, a circadian rhythm itself. And now you s what I can see essentially from, from your data is uh, um, after every meal or every time you spike in, you don't go back to the initial state or the state it should be at that time. So one thing is like how we can um, separate these two signal and processes if you have think about. And the other thing is uh, if you have tried to merge the cardiac, the heart rate variability with the glucose, uh, with the diabetic time series and if you have seen something there. All right, so I'll answer the second first. The answer is no, but we'd like to. If you had simultaneously uh, serial glucose measurements, and if you had heart rate variability, you'd be looking at autonomics, which are, are uh, perturbed in, in diabetics, you would have two, uh, two channels uh, to probe the system. I think that is potentially very interesting. Uh, that, that, that's an experiment is in the last slide that, that, that's asking to be done, a hypothesis to be tested. Uh, as far as the first part, the chronobiology is, uh, there's an enormous amount of very elegant data on. We almost, it's, it's rarely, if ever, invoked in, in clinical practice. And in, in, it, there's nothing about the time series analysis. It's not one or the other. The chronobiologic are these long uh, wavelength cycles that, that, that relate to, to uh, day, night, and circadian uh, rhythms. Those are very important. Gene has done uh, work with colleagues at, at the Brigham on that. Uh, we're looking at, in these, in these short time, shorter time scales at fluctuations that are every five minutes and up to hours. So they're embedded, they ride on top of the circadian. But in terms of looking at signals, uh, you want to look at, at all the relevant frequencies. But if you want any insight into the fast frequencies, Things that, and, and the conventional monitors sample every five minutes. Why not every 30 seconds? Why not? Because they, they're not built that way. They could. Uh, there probably is information there. This would, be, uh, you know, this would be an impetus to the companies that do that, but they would have to have a reason to do that. The doctors already have that mess of, uh, of big data. But if we could find information, and there is in fast fluctuations, so they, they, all these, it's, it's very symphonic. It's like in an orchestra. that You have everything from the basses to the piccolos. You don't want to, you know, uh, no one gets an excessive raise or is fired in that, uh, in that group. It's all part of a very orchestral type of, uh, uh, of uh, presentation. Okay, so in, in terms of the effects on the variability in the multi-scale entropy, uh, um, how are, um, and the heart rate, how are the, uh, how does exercise affect those parameters in the heart rate, and how do those effects compare with effects of, say, amphetamines or cocaine? Well, I, 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 I can't talk to the latter from either professional or personal experience, uh, <laughs> and I don't get enough exercise, so I really can't talk to the, the first part of that. But the, uh, the, 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 the deep idea uh, would be a testable hypothesis is that if you do something good to your body, if you maintain fitness, that you should expand complexity, you're, you're expanding reserve. That's testable, we don't currently do that, uh, but it's an idea. Uh, giving drugs that, that are stimulants that cause activation without sufficient recovery uh, are, is a prescription for disaster, and, and we know that from, from clinical experience. Amphetamines and cocaine are lethal, uh, and, and if you overstimulate a system without allowing it to recover, uh, in that open type of uh, far from equilibrium dynamic. If all you have is, is stimulation, if you stay up all night and drink caffeine, 
for the exam, if you kept doing that, you, you'll do yourself in. Cocaine and amphetamines are a way of doing that. Uh, we don't have any time series data on that. Uh, it, it, there would be questions of ethics and, and otherwise to try to obtain that. But one, uh, what we know is that if you over-exercise, if you exercise beyond the point of exhaustion, heart rate variability goes away. I would uh, presume uh, that with cocaine toxicity, and any cocaine is cocaine toxicity, and with uh, stimulants, it might be the same. <laughs>